lastly, we have Ralph, and uh, again, it's great to have Ralph here. Ralph was in the walk team last year for Great Britain, and they came fourth in the relay. He uh, came 20th in the long in 2013 in Finland, and he was in three J walks, 2008, 9, and 10, um, two of which I was at. And he came in J walk in 2010, he was 13th in the long, 7th in the middle, and 18th in the sprint, and 8th in the relay. So quite an amazing achievement at that level. He was selected in the Great Britain Talent Squad in 2004, and Great Britain have had a, a very structured um, talent program, squad program, over the last 10 years or so, and uh, Ralph's going to tell us a little bit about that, his, his role in that and how it helped him. I've been a complete retard and made a presentation on PowerPoint, so <laughs> excuse me while we attempt to set it up. Well, you've elected to the PowerPoint. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe you can all play on Snapchat for a little bit while we talk about it. <laughs> Here is my orienteering development. Um, so, uh, that's my date of birth. <laughs> Please don't scan me for any identity there. <laughs> Uh, I was born into an orienteering family. Um, my parents took me orienteering when I was six days old. Um, I've been disqualified from a string course in my life. Um, and yeah, growing up, it was orienteering every weekend for me. Um, I didn't particularly like it because I wanted to stay at home and watch cartoons rather than go orienteering. Um, but actually, once I got there, it was quite fun to like, play with the other kids in the bush. Um, and then, yeah, I sort of did a bit of orienteering and it was, yeah, it was, it was quite cool, the forest. Oh, we should try to speak your language. <laughs> um, and I'm from London, and I run the South London Orienteers. Um, and, yeah, I don't know what the local club stuff is like in Australia, but we didn't have it. There's no club training in Britain or anything. Um, so whenever I'd meet the club, it would be at, uh, at the races. Um, and I know you like guys like maps, so here's a map of um, some terrain near me. This is Winterfold, and this is uh, a World Cup got run in the southeast of England. This is the long distance the World Cup. Um, so this is the kind of terrain I'm, I grew up on. Um, pretty quick, uh, change in visibility. Uh, as you can see, there's contour detail, but it's all quite vague. Um, so you have to be quite good at uh, picking out the vegetation changes. As you see, there's bits of light green and green and things. Um, you get little bits of kind of mine work, um, but generally lots of path running, yeah, and pretty quick, I mean, it's quick forest. Um, uh, this is the setup of the, the GB squad. Uh, when I was, when I started, we had a start squad, the age of 14, uh, it took you up to about the age of 17. Um, and I got in a regional squad when I was two, in 2002, so when I was 12, which was the southeast. Um, two years with them, but I never used to go to regional squad trainings because I had school sport on the same day. So, yeah, I was I wasn't committed to orienteering then, um, but I managed to. I went on my summer tour in 2004 to a place called Lagomir in Scotland, and it was. Awesome. I got to spend a whole week with orienteers my age and do stuff and it was suddenly kind of, oh this is fun, like there are other people to, who have got irritating parents who brought them orienteering and I can hang out with them. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so that made quite a difference to me um, in the way I thought about orienteering and I got a bit better from that. Um, we then had a junior squad which was the like the top guys, so it would be six guys or six girls at the top end of the juniors. Um, often the guys that they thought were going to go to Jaywalk the following year. Um, and we had a senior squad from the age of 21 and above. Um, now the system is a little bit different. We have a talent squad from the age of 16 and above. And we have a development squad and we have a performance squad. Um, what they've done is they've taken out the ages on orienteering, so you're not prescribed just because you're a junior, you don't go into one of the junior squads. If you're a junior and you're exceptional, you might find yourself up in the performance squad. 
for the development squad. Um, and the idea of the development squad is that it bridges the gap from juniors to seniors. Previously, Britain's had a lot of problems with you go through JWOC and suddenly you're kicked out into the seniors and you get nothing to do for four years until you get yourself good enough to go into the World Champs team. Um, and the development squad is an idea to help bring people across, across the gap. Um, and I, so I did start squad, I got uh, two years in the junior squad, and then uh, I got myself into the development squad when they changed the system, and I'm now sitting in the performance squad. Uh, the goal of the performance squad is to get top tens of world champs within the next one to three years. Um, and I've been hit for two, so I better pull my finger out. Um, so, how did I make a JWOC team? Well, the first year I was eligible was 2007, and I missed out. Um, we have a weekend test race with a middle race on the Saturday and a long race on the Sunday, that's the way it worked. And I did really well in that middle race. I was fourth guy, I was maybe a minute down on the best, the like, best guys that, uh, the race, and I thought I was pretty awesome. And then I had the long race, I think. Uh, 75 minute winning time and I don't know, took 100 or something. Um, it went wrong physically, hit the wall. It went wrong tactically, I tried to smash it from the start and couldn't possibly do that. And it went wrong technically, I got incredibly lost. Um, so I wasn't feeling particularly pleased with myself after that. But uh, I got to go to EYOC, which is European Youth Champs which is a competition for 16s and 18s uh, among the European countries, but they seem fairly cool with anyone turning up. So if you're young and in Europe when it's on, I think you guys could easily get the spots in it. Um, I'm pretty sure the American team managed last year, so, or two years, I don't know. So, I don't know. Um, and I thought I was pretty awesome having gone been really good amongst the like the top boys in Britain. So I was like, I'm gonna kick all these foreigners' asses. What well, this is gonna be brilliant. 66th in the long and 54th in the sprint, I don't know, 25 minutes down on a 50 minute long race or something, and you know, almost an equal distance on the sprint or something. Um, so it didn't go very well. And I was sat, it was in Hungary, it was a bit grim, um, but it was quite an adventure actually. I'd gone in between uh, school exams, which was, I don't know, thanks to parents, but yeah, it was, it was cool, but it was a bit, it was depressing basically, to have gone from being what I considered uh, really good in Britain, and suddenly to be thrown out uh, on the continent, and just see these guys who were just so much better than me. But, it was fun. So in 2008, I worked out that if I wanted to get to Junior World Champs, I needed to improve my physical ability. So I got myself a training plan uh, and a good training group. So I joined a local road cross country club. Um, and I ran these times, which, I mean, they're all right. Um, <laughs> And I had got myself a, a coach as well, a personal coach, who kind of helped me talk a bit about orienteering. And he, he had a bit of uh, experience of orienteering on the continent, so he could tell me a little bit about how races work there. Um, I got some more international experience. I managed to convince my parents to take me to some uh, holiday races in, in Europe. So I ran in France, um, got on a, uh, did a bit more in Sweden, went to Norway. Um, went to Jaywalk and disaster again. Uh, 114 in the sprint. Good, uh, shocking middle qualification, reasonable middle final, and 100 in the long. Um, and that was another kind of reality check. Again, I guess going up into like the big boys at Junior World Champs, um, uh, and taught me a lot actually about. My, like mind setting and goal setting in that my goal for the year was to go to Junior World Champs so once I got myself in the team then there was no longer any any training 
plan or ideas or anything. So I just sat around feeling awesome. <laughs> and then I turned up in Sweden in 2008 and was shocked to find that I was rather a long way behind everyone else. Um, and, but it got, got to EYC again because they moved it later in the year. And 28th and long, not so good. And then 7th in the sprint. And this was the first time I'd actually run a good international race. And it, it came as quite a shock because I'd had like, bad experiences before. Um, but it, taught, it said to me that actually it's possible for me to, to do well if I kind of concentrate and get a bit of luck and do things properly. Um, so that motivated me again um, for the next year, 2009, um, and I got a bit fitter again, 16, 11, 5k, and I ran, I used to run all cross country, didn't ever run any track, and I was 18 for the English schools, um, and that was quite a big thing for me because it was a lot better than I'd ever done before, and quite significantly better than I'd done before, and it made me think, is orienteering the right sport for me, or should I actually have a crack at like athletics or cross country or something, and just see where that got me. Um, and with that physical ability, we had a squad time trial um, on a selection race weekend. So on the Saturday, they marked a course in the forest, and we ran three loops in the forest, individual start, two minute intervals or something. So I didn't see anyone, came to the finish and found out that I won by a minute against all the other juniors. Um, so that made me feel pretty good about my physical ability and I was always better physically than I was technically and from that result I kind of went, well if, I'm so, if I can do it physically, if I'm so much better over it, it was 21 minutes and I've beaten by a minute on that so it's quite a big percentage and it gave me so much confidence to just focus on the orienteering and rather than focus on the running, uh, focus on the technical side and I won every single domestic race that year in Britain. Um, so I felt pretty good, went to Jaywalk, didn't have a great sprint race, came 30 seconds, um, but I injured myself on the second control of the long, um, which was pretty devastating actually. Um, we waited in a thunderstorm on the top of this Italian mountain for like three hours in quarantine, motivated myself like, oh, I'm going to run in jacket, oh come on, like jacket off, start. <laughs> Bit of a mistake, the first control, all right, no, sort this out. Big long leg, smashing it across some stuff, like roll my ankle. Um, and I was like, ah, damn it. Um, and I remember, like, got the bus back, and everyone was depressed. Um, people had had terrible runs, and it was wet and horrible. And, and then in the evening, we started, the boys who run the course started going through their splits, and I was just like, I was kind of lying underneath the table, so they were all doing it, and I was lying underneath the table like this, just feeling so devastated that I hadn't been able to take part in it. Um, and I think that's what, I'd always wondered whether I was doing orienteering because I was good at it, or because my parents had started it, or because I actually wanted to do it, and that for me was the moment where I was like, actually I do care quite a lot about this, and I should um, give it a go. So next year, uh, went to university and success. Uh, goal was I want to get a top 10, got myself a top 10. Um, how did I get that? Well, I went to university, that put me in a, uh, we have lots of orienteering going on at some universities in Britain and I went to Sheffield, which is up in the north of England, which has lots of orienteering. Um, big training group, guys better than me at orienteering all orienteers, all my mates, people who I'd grown up with from my very first training camp in 2004, suddenly I was at university with them and we'd train and we'd party and we'd just spend all the time together and it was absolutely brilliant. Um, motivation, training, um, Chris Jones who uh, was second in the sprint race, I trained with him every day for like three months. So I saw him more than he saw his girlfriend, so we have a special <laughs> um, I got myself a new personal coach um, because uh, basically I'd sort of outgrown the knowledge of the first one I'd got. He was very helpful starting me off on everything and I got a new one to push me a bit further. Um, 
and he told me a, what lesson the first time I met with him. Um, he told me what I wanted, and I told him I wanted to be world champion, and he told me a story. He said that there were two junior boys in Britain who were very, very good, very, very equal growing up, and when they left the junior ranks and left university, one of them got a full-time job, and one of them became a professional orienteer, and one of them got very good at orienteering, and one of them is world champion. And he asked me what I wanted to do. Well, yeah, I don't really want to get a job. <laughs> <laughs> so, I got a lot more experience, um, racking up more countries. For Denmark, it was um, forested sand dunes, so I went out and I ran on all the forested sand dunes I could find. Uh, I got myself a strategy for how to deal with the terrain, which was whenever it gets low visibility, is to check exactly where it was when I went into the low visibility, because that prevented you losing horrendous amounts of time. Um, terrain confidence. And I got my physical ability up. So that's my last year in K-Walk. Um, however, was it a failure? Um, sprint 18. Like, I was beating some of the, I was beating the senior guys at the start of the year who went to world champs at Sprint in Britain. I was quicker than my mate who was second at the start of the year. And I, yeah, did I run a bad sprint race? 13th in a long, not great race. Sort of jogged round, made a bit of a mistake, came 13th. Could I have got top six in the long, top six in the sprint as well? Um, so anyway, that seven put me uh, on the like fast track into the senior team and I got selected for a pre-World Champs camp at the end of the year. Um, that was good, that motivated me. And it got me a Swedish club, which was very, very good. Um, although I turned up with Graham Griswold and Scott Fraser to their first, to their training camp. And uh, Graham had won the relay in 2008 and Scott had got uh, some very, very good results. And I turned up and they were like, oh, cool, Graham's got to join the club. And they brought their little friend who's not very good at orienteering the camp. And I beat them all in Portugal, and that felt pretty awesome. Um, I um, kind of quit all the British activities that year. So I spent my Easter in Sweden running the Swedish races there. And then I spent the whole of the summer in Sweden. Uh, got sort of offers, oh, do you want to come on GB squad camp? And I was like, no, I'm staying in Sweden. I think it's really good for my orienteering. Um, which it was, but it maybe wasn't quite so good for my relationship with the British team that year. Um, I ran a senior international around Nordic Orienteering Tour and I got the 36 in the sprint. Um, pushed on with my physical training that year, worked hard in university and worked hard when I was abroad and ran 847, 3K and 3219 for 10. Um, so it was all feeling pretty good and I was getting better technically. Um, and in 2012, I got injured. I um, completely fractured my metatarsal, um, and the doctors were very shocked. They're like, "How on earth can you do this? It looks like a stress fracture. You've broke." And I went, "Well, it kind of hurt a bit, and kept on running. Um, so don't do that." Um, so yeah, I lost six months with no running, um, which was a blessing in disguise because it happened at the time I wanted to. I needed to write my dissertation for my final year of university and that getting injured got me an extension on my dissertation so I probably wouldn't have passed university if I hadn't worked. But I did. <laughs> uh, but I moved to Sweden uh, after finishing university and went basically a week later moved to Sweden. Um, got a sort of had a summer internship with Scania who made trucks and buses. And so it was awesome. I was like, I've got a job. None of my other friends have got jobs. Um, feeling on top of the world was in the country I wanted to be doing orienteering, part-time work. Um, so 2013, in Sweden, training environment, awesome. Uh, regular orienteering relevant training, be that either orienteering with a map or just smashing terrain intervals, running in marshes, running up and down hills all the time in the forest. 
uh, with a very, very good training group. It was awesome to have gone from the fastest or the best guy at university into being the worst guy in another training group. Always try and get, always try and train with people who are better than you, because it makes you, you raise yourself to their level. And I ran 8.35 for 3K uh, in a training, in a spontaneous training session basically. So I was pretty fit. I got myself big race experience from domestic Swedish competitions, which are just like any, just amazing. The fact that there are so many guys, every single split, who take time out of you. As you don't, you lose time without you even realizing it. And these guys show you where, where you do it. And big thing for me, I got in the first team at Tia Mila for my Swedish club, um, which had been a bit of a goal. Um, and this is, this is Tia Mila, I know you like maps. So this is me, um, I went to, I ran eighth leg. Uh, oh, no, ninth leg. Day uh, nine kilometers or something. And everyone had been drumming this up as, oh, this is the most pressure you'll ever be under. Like world champs, the pressure is you training with a group of guys all the time, and then you have to try and do a result, do a race with them. So I'm thinking, oh God, this is, how nervous am I, like, am I going to be good enough? And boop, 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 boop. we're all very, very good, apart from this little mistake up here. Um, and this is my first orienteering epiphany, is I knew exactly where it was there. And I just went, oh, it's just down there. Two minutes later, gone. Like, gone out of fourth, could have caught third there if I hadn't made that mistake. And then sitting at the end, going, having had quite a good run, thinking, why am I such an idiot? How, if I knew where I was, did I then not go in the right direction? And that was quite a sobering thought in that actually, I'm quite good at orienteering, and if I take the time to work out where I want to go next, there isn't any reason why I should get lost. Um, so the next big race was Yukla, and this is the Yukla map, um, where I had a very, this is long night, and I had a very, very good run. I was ninth on a long night, and I took the team from 54th to 12th or something, so I was feeling very pleased with myself. Um, the coach, I ran in the second team though, which irritated me immensely. But we had a very good first team and a very good second team to start with. And then and the coach said to me, oh, one of the guys is feeling a bit sick. So you know that you're like an option for the first team. And I was like, oh yeah, cool, cool. And he got sick and he dropped out and they put someone else in. And I was like, ah, he's quite good, it's okay. And then another guy got sick. And I was like, I'm close to the team. <laughs> and they put someone else in. And then a third guy got sick, and they didn't put me in the team. And, they were, and then that left the second team short, and they, they, all, they said, you're the only guy who can run far enough at night to run this leg. And I was very, very angry with them. I was like, I'm gonna show them why I should have been in the first team. It was all it was very, very good, good day. Um, yeah. Um, so that was all leading up to towards World Champs. So I got total experience. I got 17 different countries that were volunteered, 17 different types of terrain, and a new coach as well. Uh, and I made World Champs, and there'd been a bit of basically the British guys who'd gone the two years before had missed out on qualifying. So I was like, oh, this is going to be quite difficult. I'll take, I'll just, I really hope I qualify. And I qualified easy and ran well. World Champs long, came 20th. Felt very pleased with myself. Um, pretty good race. Um, a bit of like, a bit of stuff here and there, but yeah, maybe like a minute or something over whatever, an hour and seven or something. So, yeah. Pleased myself. So I was like, right, here we go, moving forwards. 2014, big year, big year coming up. And I got injured again. I 
got another stress, got a stress just as stress fracture this time, which was three months out. Um, so I decided I needed new training ideas, and the training ideas was there is no way I can run enough without breaking myself. I'm going to have to learn how to cross train, so I would sit on the bike for an hour a day uh, and run as well. And I'd go in the gym and make my legs stronger to cope with the loading forces. Got myself 23rd at middle at European Champs, quite happy with myself, but I skipped, I opted to skip World Champs uh, that year. Focused on my Swedish races. Team Mila and Nicola, uh, round last leg, Team Mila, Team came third. Awesome, everyone felt very good. Yukla ran first leg, came back uh, at the front of the pack. Pleased myself, team came third. Uh, ran Swedish champs, and this was a big thing for me, is this was the first time I'd ever been fast enough to get a top result in Sweden. Previously, if I'd done the best time I could have done, I'd have still only been 10th or something. And this was the first time I was running fast enough to have been up in the medal position. Swedish champs. So all going very, very good. Um, and then we had home world champs this year. Um, and it was all well. I worked quite hard. Things went, I killed some good races in Portugal this year. I ran well at Swedish champs middle, got some faster track times. Uh, and I did more training. But uh, I. Um, uh, ruined Tia Mila for everyone, which wasn't good. I also ruined Yukula for everyone, which wasn't good either. I ran terribly at the World Cups. Um, I got stressed and sick and overtrained, like trying to get as fit as possible for World Champs, basically. Um, came off the back of the Easter races, not having run as well as I wanted to, and smashed the training for a month and got sick. Um, so World Champs was sort of a positive and sort of a negative for me this year. Um, negative in that I actually really wanted to run the middle as well as the relay and I wasn't good enough to get in the team. Um, and like we came fourth in the relay but like we were very very close to a medal. And once again it was all my fault. So yeah. Um, so. But it was pretty, I mean, it's awesome to run at our home world champs. Um, and we had good fun as a team, and we did it wrong. Uh, so the key factors are, uh, if I break it down into lifestyle, um, moving to Sweden, massive deal. Getting part-time work, massive deal. It's, it's just very, very difficult to do the training and not that I ever have had a full-time job, but I imagine it's quite difficult to get the training, get the training and the recovery and get time off. If you're still always struggling, I need time off to do this race. If you don't have a job, then you always have time off to do the races. Um, and I've been very lucky getting support from uh, my Swedish club and British Orienteering and well now we're in Australia, letting me bum around for another six months. So. Fantastic. <laughs> Mental factors. Uh, confidence that my orienteering is good from putting myself in pretty pressure situations. So, home world champs relay last leg. Did I do a good job orienteering? Yeah. So, I, why can't I orienteer in the next pressure situation? All of the evidence is there to suggest I can do uh, An understanding that if I just take the time and go, actually, Shall I just check my compass and check all the features? Oh, it's actually that way rather than that way. But I shouldn't lose huge amounts of time. Um, te technical experience. Go and get in as much different terrain as possible. You've got granite, gold mining, and spur gully in Australia. That's three types. Go to Europe. There's so much more terrain types to go and experience. Even within you like Switzerland, that would be different. Uh, Finland, wherever Jaywalk is next year, you need to go in the right part of Finland to get that experience. Um, and a kind of model of how I want to orient here. Uh, physical, time and terrain in Sweden, big deal. Running terrain intervals, marsh intervals, orienteering intervals, getting the strength to run in the forest. Um, and I've got reasonable ground speed, which means that yeah, my sprint orienteering is quite okay. Uh, tactical, doing, doing more races. 
running in relays, looking at how the best guys run, when they push, when they slow down, looking at their GPS tracks, looking at my own race system head to head, and extra uh, fun. If orienteering is not fun for you, there is no way you can put yourself through the uh, experiences that you have to to be good at orienteering. Like the first, the 2004 tour that started it all for me, um, went to university with three of the guys who were there, and the, one of them was my roommate at World Champs this year. So you're going to make friends for life. <laughs> uh, so what's missing? Why, why aren't I better? I get injured too much. Injuries mean that I can't do the training required. I can't train twice a day, every day, 52 weeks a year. I need to run more in terrain. I'm still weak. The guys still take time out of me in the terrain. I need money. <laughs> <laughs> and I need more world ranking points. Um, so if you sum that up, I need more training time and I need more money. And that will get me better world ranking points that will get me a better start at world champs. So be better. Does anyone have any questions? What was your motivation to come to Australia? Um, I didn't. Um, I was in a kind of difficult point in Sweden that I'd had quite a tough year, um, and it felt like I needed to to break from that. And the option was go to London or go to Australia. And uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, summer in Australia sounds very good, and it especially sounds very good when people tell you how cold and miserable it is in Sweden right now. Um, I wouldn't be able to run in the Swedish winter, basically. I can run here, so that's good. So yeah, it was very easy. All right, thank you very much, Ralph.